Well, good morning and welcome to our series, God and Doubt. I'm Pastor Jim and I'm really glad you're here. What a huge crowd. I understand we're completely overflowing the overflow. So we're delighted you all are here. So whether you're here in person or if you're joining us via the live feed, uh, you're welcome also. And I hope that uh, today is a great day for you being here. Uh, As you can see from our little sermon uh, video intro, and by the way, aren't those clever that they do? I'm so in awe of our tech team. I think we've got the best tech team. Yeah, give my hand. I think we have the best tech team in the whole world. I mean, these volunteers, the graphic uh, designers we have will volunteer their time. I just can't tell how much we appreciate all of that. So good job. But as you can see uh, today, what we're going to be talking about is intellectual doubt. Things that cause us to question and doubt our faith mentally. Or perhaps, if if you're not a a person of faith, to, uh, to keep you from ever having faith. Intellectual doubt. I'll give you an, uh, an example of how that affects us. Um, when I was a freshman in university, my very first class, my very first day of university was a large interdisciplinary class that all freshmen had to take. Remember those class courses? Everybody had to take it. And uh, so I was in one section and there were a huge, huge classroom. And every seat was full, and we were all there with our pencils and papers and our, you know, we weren't in high school anymore, we were in university. So it was a really big deal. And uh, I will never forget that the instructor we had was uh, also uh, very young. And he was teaching this course called Western Civilization, which was combined with the English and History Department. And uh, I do remember thinking to myself, yeah, I don't think there's anything civilized about a big room full of 18-year-olds. But anyway, that's where we were all there together. And this guy was, uh, was young himself. He had just graduated from Yale University. Ooh, rich, uh, important this man is. Yes, certainly. I think he thought so. And... Um, We also found out that he had uh, applied at several other uh, more prestigious schools, but instead it ended up at this rather small uh, town, small university that that I was attending. We also learned later that he was a devout atheist, which was interesting because this was a Christian school right in the middle of the Bible Belt. So it made for some real interesting dynamics later. But the thing that I will never forget that has stuck with me is that first day, the first words out of his mouth were, ladies and gentlemen, I suddenly felt important, ladies and gentlemen, and he held up the Bible. He said, the purpose of this class for this year will be to convince you that this book, the Bible he held up, is no more truthful or supernatural than this book. And he held up a copy of the ancient Babylonian poem, Gilgamesh Epic. He said, both these books are fables written by men full of stories. And then he said, I want you to forget everything you've ever heard at church because I'm going to tell you the truth. Several girls fainted at that point. They just... (laughs) (laughs) I didn't do that. (laughs) So um, I remember thinking, though, I remember thinking to myself, Toto, we're not in Sunday school anymore. (laughs) You know, I make light of it now, but I I want you to know it was, uh, it was like a cold bath had just been dumped all over every single one of us. And I know part of that was his purpose, and I understand the whole thing about causing you to begin to think and You know, when you've never thought before and to engage with the world around you. I understand all that. But the point was, he wasn't just kidding about it. That really was his purpose. And what I found out was that this small Christian school had been overtaken by a lot of academics who believed that Christianity and the Bible were at the best man-made suggestions and at the worst Uh, very terribly corrupted uh, religious uh, fables. 
Over the next four years, I watched as many of my friends, many people that I'd grown up with, I'd gone to church camp with, I watched them fall by the wayside as many of them rejected their faith and no longer believed in God or gave themselves over to the, the gods of the 1960s. And there were a lot of them <laughs> back then, trust me. For me, uh, it was a harrowing journey, to say the least. I think I've said, shared before that I was a double major in religion and philosophy, so I got a double blast from the liberal religious teachers and the atheistic philosophy teachers every single day for four years. And, uh, and I staggered to the graduation day, still believing and claiming that I was a Christian. But I tell you, some days I wasn't so sure. Have you ever been through anything like that yourself? Ever, maybe you went to a university or a school, private school, where they did that. Maybe, uh, maybe the military, maybe a sorority or fraternity or something. Maybe... Uh, Maybe some friends, you know, you became a believer, a uh, follower of God, or a believer in God and follower of Christ. They didn't, and so they were constantly, you know, after you after that. Ever that happened to you? If it did, you know what I'm talking about. It can, be, it can be really, really, really painful to go through that. As a matter of fact, I would say I believe that out of all the types of doubt that we're going to be talking about in this series, intellectual doubt is by far the most pervasive and the most damaging of all the kinds of doubt. And more people wind up getting hung up on it, not being able to get over the, the problem of doubt, of intellectual doubt. So if you've ever experienced anything like that, or maybe today you know, you've got your own thoughts on this, then, boy, you've come to the right place because today we're going we're gonna to talk about some good things that I hope will be helpful to you. Now, a couple of things I want you to realize before we begin. They were so important, I wrote them down. Number one, we're not going to be able to cover everything it's understandable. Short talk, big subject. But we will give you at the end of today's service uh, a suggestion, a list of, of uh, websites and books and, and uh, other things you can go and if you're interested in this track down. Number two that you need to know, I did not go to, to uh, Yale, which is where this really smart guy went. <laughs> but I can read. So what? No applause? I thought that would at least get spoiled. Still, I want, to realize, I want you to realize that I know that you know that I am not the sharpest tool in the toolbox. I understand that. But since I know how to read, I read a lot of people who are smart, like really, really smart. I don't always understand every word. I keep a dictionary close at hand. But the point is, is I'm talking today, I'm going to be talking about things that you may look at me and say, Why, who does he think he is? He just, you know... Where did he read that? You know, and I'll, I'll tell you where I read it. That's why we're going to give this list. And I want you to realize that I don't have the answers for everything. But I do believe that just because I'm not the smartest guy in the world, there are people that are really, really smart who've thought through these topics and these subjects, and they've got some amazing answers. And so what I'm going to try and do is put you in touch with some of them. And then finally, the last thing I want you to remember as we talk today is this. I do not believe <clears throat> that um, you can know God just through mental exercise, as important as it may be. Because the Bible tells us that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so if you're going to really connect with the God of the universe, I think it has to be on a deep level, a real level, but a deep level, not necessarily one that you can, you know, slice and dice and, and boil with a Bunsen burner. Doesn't mean it's not true, it's not real. So don't think that today what we're trying to do is to talk anybody <laughs> into being a Christian simply by thinking their way there, because that's not what it's about. But I do think that oftentimes there are hurdles, if you would, that are between us and, and believing in God or becoming a Christian, and those hurdles can, can really hinder us. And the whole objective of today is to help push some of those hurdles out of the way for you, hopefully, or maybe better yet, give you the ability to push those things out of the way. So... That's what we're going to be doing. As a matter of fact, I think this is so important. Why don't we stop and we'll pray about it. Shall we do that? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for being such a, a kind and a generous and a good God. Lord, we honor you today. We celebrate you. And, and, and Lord, I know there's a lot of people in this room, a lot of people listening to the sound of my voice who are coming from all kinds of different 
positions and situations. Some who are people of faith, some who've not people of faith, they're animosity, animus, uh, uh, animosity towards faith. But Lord, I thank you that, Lord, you care about each and every person and that you're willing, Lord, to reveal yourself to us if we are simply re- re- willing to seek and uh, to knock and, Lord, to desire for understanding. We want to know you're there. We want to know who you are. And we want to know what you want of us. So, Lord, we ask that today you would, uh, you would be here and, and present. And, Lord, that you would be our teacher for none other can. Thank you, Father. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, intellectual doubt. What is intellectual doubt? Well, it's doubt resulting from the mistaken belief that knowledge, human knowledge, and faith, spiritual faith, are mutually exclusive. In other words, you can't be intelligent and also be a believer in God or a Christian. It's the uh, idea that uh, science has made religion essentially obsolete. I mean, people used to believe in God hundreds of years ago, but now we know better. Now we have an explanation for everything, so we don't need God anymore. It's a lack of confidence that the Bible is trustworthy or true. That's been one of the main things that the people who have been against faith, not wanting people to believe in God, have attacked. And they've been doing it for the last 300 years. really started back... uh, period of enlightenment, as people knew that before they got rid of God, they were going to first have to get rid of his book. And so there's been this all-out assault on the Bible, trying to disprove it, to say that it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's been corrupted, that it's full of errors, that there's contradictions, that there's one God in the Old Testament, another in the New Testament, that the uh, authors of the New Testament wrote much later than is claimed. And so it, it, you, you really can't believe much in there. I mean, yeah, it's got some good stories. Yeah, it encourages some good moral values, but from the standpoint of really being the Word of God revealed to humankind, certainly it's not that. Another thing is that in the last, oh, I would say especially 10 to 12 years, 15 years, there's been an amazing rise in atheism and agnosticism, and not just the uh, old variety. When I was uh, uh, in university, uh, there were obviously atheists, had been atheists uh, uh, for generations. But the atheists uh, in the 60s and 70s were much milder than what we have today. Uh, their claim was that uh, God was dead. You know, God is dead. That was the big thing you read all the time. It was even in the headlines uh, back uh, in the day. And essentially the point was that the God of tradition was dead. That now then because we were so sophisticated in the 1960s, you know, we didn't need, we knew, you know, we had put people in space. We had actually gone around the earth. We, uh, there was a Russian scientist, I think the, uh, uh, a cosmonaut, the first one, uh, Yuri Gagarin, wasn't who went in space and came back and, and one of the news conferences uh, afterwards, uh, they made a big deal out of saying, we sent someone to heaven, the Russian said, and there was no God there. You know, he's, he's not there. We didn't see him. So that's, that was the kind of thing you faced. It was almost, I don't know, today it seems rather simplistic and, and, and almost humorous. Today, what we have uh, are a form of atheists that are much different. That's what I call militant atheism. These are people who not only believe that they don't want to be Christians, they don't want you to be a Christian. As a matter of fact, they believe that religion and faith in general are terrible things. And uh, anyone who believes them, there's probably something wrong with them. Especially if you're any kind of conservative or fundamental religious person, then you are dangerous. (laughs) And you probably need to be locked up and, you know, kept there until you change your mind. And so you've got people like Richard Dawkins with the God delusion, Christopher Hitchens, God is not great, Sam Harris, uh, even uh, Stephen Hawking, um, the the great astrophysicist. Um, And and so there's been almost really a campaign. I mean, when I was uh, younger, you would never walk into a bookstore and see books on atheism, or you would never uh, flip on a a program, uh, the internet then, but radio now today with the internet, uh, man, you can, you can Google atheist or atheism, and there's 10,000 sites you can go to. It's absolutely incredible. It's a different world in which we live. It's like the assault against people of faith has become even stronger. Uh, for example, look at some of these quotes. I love uh, what Max Born, the great Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist of an earlier uh, date, once said. He said, religious belief is not a sign of stupidity any more than unbelief is a sign of intelligence. Yes, you don't know you're going to need that, but you will. Write that down because one of these days you're going to be in a conversation with somebody and you're going to be able to pull that out and read it to them and you're going to feel a lot better after you do. So, 
be helpful. How about this? This is from John, the author John Marsh, uh, who, who is an American. He's written, there is a blatant attempt among American atheists to rebrand themselves brights, implying atheists are clever and theists are stupid. Ever, ever feel that way after watching one of those debates or programs or maybe not? What's the, I love this quote. They're one of the guys, if you ever want to really investigate this, I would encourage you that right now, probably the leading uh, Christian uh, person that you can benefit from listening to in this area is a man named Dr. John Lennox from Oxford. He's a mathematician, philosopher there, teaches uh, that there. And uh, I was able to uh, see him in, uh, in person in Australia at this pastor's conference we went to in Sydney uh, last uh, summer. Brilliant guy, has uh, debated some of the leading militant atheists. And uh, he has an excellent conclusion on this. Look at his quote. Very often today, we see the explanation that everything must be explained either by God or by science. And the more science advances, the less space there is for God. This seems to me to be very wrong-headed for the following simple reason. It's not either or. God and science are not in the same category or categories. God is a personal God who created and maintains the universe. He is the sole agent responsible for its existence. Science is a set of disciplines that investigates how it works and what it's made of. Do you see the subtle difference? Scientists deal with the rational, the empirical, that which can be analyzed, put in, and investigate the scientific method approached. God, on the other hand, is what? Much more far-reaching. He deals with much grander, bigger, glorious things. Matter of fact, he ends up this uh, uh, section where he's writing this with a quote by the statement. He says, of course, it's also true that had God not created the universe, the scientists would have nothing to investigate. <laughs> which I thought was a rather clever way of saying it. So what's the point? The point is, is that when you feel attacked, assaulted by people who are trying to villainize you for being religious, especially if you're a, a Christian, you just need to take a big breath and relax. It's okay. Just because they're loud and they're smart, that mean they're right. It's important to remember that. What's the answer? I think the answer is this. The existence of God cannot be proven. I'll grant you that. Absolutely. I cannot prove to you today that God exists. I cannot empirically, rationally prove you. But the other thing you need to remember is neither can God's existence be what? Be disproven. Because it deals on a whole different level than this other level that the, the critics want to talk about. Just because something cannot be empirically demonstrated does not mean it doesn't exist. For example, I love my wife. I can't show you that love in a, you know, in a box or you know, in a building, but I, I'm affected by that on a daily basis, and it makes me a different person. So does the existence of God. Uh, purpose and meaning in your life. How can, you, how, can you, how can you cut that up? How can you dissect that? You can't. Or if you're a philosopher, how about the existence of the past? Did you know philosophers agree that there's no way we can know for sure that the past ever happened? I mean, we think it did. We see artifacts that look like they're old, but maybe somebody could have faked those. You know, we have writings where people say they were in the past. We have photographs that are in the past up to a certain point. We realize that obviously we're here now, but we cannot 100% know what happened before. All we can know is what we've experienced, if you want to define it in the most literal way. And I know a bunch of you just said, he read that somewhere. <laughs> he did. I know he didn't. Think that. You're right. I didn't read that somewhere. Anyway, the point is what? Even though we cannot prove God, I believe, as do many other people who take it seriously, that there is evidence that God exists and evidence that the Bible is a reliable source of truth. Enough evidence, and again, I agree, evidence is not proof, but enough evidence that for me, it's compelling. It gets compelling enough for me to give it a sincere, genuine investigation. And that's what I want to challenge you to do if you're here today and you have doubts or maybe you don't believe at all. At least be willing to listen to the evidence. Would you do that? Any rational logical person should be willing to do that.
Because fortunately for me, what happened was when I left that university and graduated from my undergraduate schools, I had a decision to make to what I was going to do. And to be honest with you, I had gone into the university thinking I was going to perhaps go into some type of religious work because even though I had drifted a lot from my childhood faith as I got into my teen years, the last two years of my high school, uh, God really got a hold of my heart and, and my life was turned around. It was an amazing thing. And so I went in as a freshman in university thinking I was going to study religion and philosophy in order to be either a teacher or a pastor or something. But at the end of that time, I was so disillusioned, I wasn't sure if I, what I wanted to do. And, and certainly religion was maybe one of the last careers I was thinking about. Fortunately, a good friend of mine got a hold of me and said, listen, I can tell you've got a lot of questions, a lot of things you don't understand, a lot of doubts. I would encourage you to do something. Go visit this school called Dallas Theological Seminary. Go spend a day there. See what they do there and see if you'd have any interest. So I did that, and fortunately what I found was a school that took academics and the Bible and theology very seriously. And I found out that there were learned, brilliant, intelligent men and women who were way smart, way much smarter than me, and they were as smart as all the doubters back at university. And I found out there were answers for the questions. All I was getting was the questions back there. Suddenly somebody started giving me the answers. And I realized that the Bible is true. It is defendable. It is historic. Linguistically, grammatically, archaeologically, the Bible can be seen to be reliable. I did understand a lot of the things that were going on in my head that I didn't understand. And those additional four years brought me to a whole new place. Well, let me share with you what I believe some of this evidence is. First of all, let's start by looking at the biblical evidence. It's a good place to start, I believe, because God actually has some things to say about his own existence. Did you know that? About how you can know that God is, is there. He, he talks about it in the book of Romans, of all places. If you've never read the New Testament, the book of Romans is unlike anywhere, anything else in, in all the New Testament. You know, Paul, Paul the Apostle, who wrote 13 of the 27, what we now call books, they were letters when he was writing them, uh, the books of the New Testament, so that's half the New Testament, um, saved his best for the book of Romans. Uh, it was uh, late in his ministry. He was on his third and last missionary journey. He was uh, staying in Corinth, and he'd been trying to get to Rome to visit the great city, the, the capital of the empire. A church had begun there. Apparently, some of the people from uh, the day of Pentecost had gone back to Rome and had founded a church there, and Paul had heard about it. And, of course, he realized being in Rome, it was going to become what? The most important church in the world. Because at that time, Rome was the capital of everything. So anything that came out of there was going to be critical. So that's why Paul took, apparently, more time and put great thought into writing the book of Romans. It is incredible. Its 16 chapters are magnificent. It is the summation, the culmination. Uh, it, it, it is the piece de resistance of everything that Paul wrote. First 11 chapters deal with all theology and belief. Uh, the last 12 through 16 deal with how we put that into practice in our regular lives. Wonderful book. And in Romans chapter 1, Paul starts by talking first about how everyone, no matter who you are, needs to be forgiven of sin, needs to be saved, as he says. And then he explains why. He explains why in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. I'm going to read the light type. I'd like you to read the dark, bold type with me. Would you do that? This is what Paul wrote. For the wrath of God, the, the judgment of God, the, the, the punishment of God is against sin. Sin is something God cannot tolerate. He is sinless. He is completely, totally good and holy. So the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That word suppress means to, to hold down or to bind. So there are people by the way they live who are suppressing the truth of God's existence. People look at the way people live and they think, oh, God doesn't exist because look how cruel these people are. Look how awful they are. Look at the evil and the hurtful things they've done. Look at the atrocities that have gone on. Look at the war. Look at the murder. Look at the death. Surely there must not be a God. Oh, no, he's there. It's just that the wickedness of men and women are blinding your eyes to see it. This suppresses the truth and unrighteousness because, read this with me, that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, all the characteristics that 
We can't see, but they're there. His eternal power, he's always been, and his divine nature, what? Have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. What's he saying? He's saying the existence of God has forever been known to human beings by how? By walking out on a dark night and looking up in the sky. And what do you see? You see things that take your breath away. You see things that convince you, this is greater than me. There must be something greater than me because this world is absolutely an incredible place. Point number one, God has made himself evident. The Greek word means to, to make clear or visible, but interestingly enough, the root word that it comes from literally means to shine. A lot of people think that Paul was actually doing a little play on words here. He was essentially saying, we see God in creation, and he is shining brightly for us to see, which immediately makes you think of what? The sun during the day and the stars at the night. Uh, that's what he's essentially saying, that, that God is in creation. And we know that. Have you ever... ever seen this picture before? This is uh, what's called the Hubble Deep Field picture. It was taken back uh, about six or seven years ago, one of the very first pictures that was published. It actually was taken over a period of uh, eight days. Uh, it took that long to process it between December the 18th or 10 days, between December 18th and December 26th, 1995. It shows the stars in the Milky Way from the southern sky, and in the picture, this is a little bit of a blow-up, but if you have like about double this size, in that size picture, do you know what you see? Those little dots are not just stars, they are galaxies. Not solar systems, but galaxies like the Milky Way galaxies. In the deep field picture, there were 3,000 different galaxies. Can you believe that? It's especially amazing when you think that this picture is, the only, is one tiny part of the sky. A, a, a way of uh, understanding would be if you took a tennis ball and you held it out at arm's length, that's how big a picture of the sky is where these 3,000 galaxies are. It is one um, twenty-four uh, tw millionth of the whole sky. So you can imagine there'd be 24 million tennis balls. And they would all have 3,000 galaxies in them. Now, a lot of people look at that and they do what? It makes them believe there is no God. I mean, how can we believe in God on earth when there's this vastness of space? What does it make me think? Wow, God's a whole lot bigger than I thought he was. He is really big. He's really amazing. No wonder David wrote in Psalm 19, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. One galaxy? Wow. A hundred million galaxies? Whoa. You understand? Another good way that we see God in creation is not just the, the, the greatness of creation, but also the intricacies of creation. You know what this is, don't you? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a human eye. You have two of them. <laughs> you look at them every day. Well, the next time you look at your eye in a mirror, or the next time you look at, you know, your husband or your wife or your kids, you know, someone you love, peer deeply into their eyes. You know what you're seeing? You're seeing an evidence of God. That's what many people, Christian and non, uh, believe about the eye, that it is so incredibly complex, it's mystifying how it could have in any way come about by chance. Why do they say that? Well, this comes from John Blanchard's book, Does God Believe in Atheists? He's written, the human eye is a truly amazing phenomenon. Although accounting for just one uh, four thousandths of an adult's weight. It is the medium through which uh, we process 80% of the information we get. The tiny retina contains about 130 million rod-shaped cells which detect light intensity and transmit impulses to the visual cortex of the brain by means of some one million nerve fibers. While nearly six, listen to this, six million cone-shaped cells do the same job but respond specifically to color variation. That's how you see color. The eyes can handle 500,000 messages simultaneously and are kept clear by ducts producing just the right amount of fluid with which the lens clean both eyes simultaneously in one thousandth of a second. And people look at that and say, whoa, wow, that was lucky that came about. <laughs> As a matter of fact, so complex is the human eye, none other than the great 
Scientist Charles Darwin himself wrote in The Origin of the Species, to suppose that the eye with all its inimitable contrivances from adjusting the focus to different distances for emitting different amounts of light with the correction of spherical and chromatic aberrations could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest sense. You may know that Darwin was not an atheist. He believed in God. He was just trying to figure out how God did it. And although he struggled to believe that the human eye could come about over time, he did believe it came about over time, but he still believed that there had to be somebody who started the design. Isn't that amazing? I, I like this last picture. You know what this is? This is the, uh, what do they call it? The Helix uh, Nebula, about 700,000 uh, light years from the Earth. And when the Hubble telescope people captured it, you know what they called it? The eye of God. <laughs> It's so amazing to me that people don't believe in God <laughs> can call something the eye of God. Fascinating, isn't it? So what are we saying? Well, there's a second point. Not only do we see God in creation, but we see God in another way, according to Paul in Romans. We see God in the way human beings know right from wrong. God has made himself evident with us. How? It explains it in chapter 2, verse 14. Look there with me. Even... Gentiles, non-Jews, who do not have God's Old Testament law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it even though they haven't heard it. What's he talking about? Even in ancient times, much less today, you get a group of people together and some horrible things begin to happen. I mean, they begin to beat and rape some seven-year-old girl somewhere down deep inside. Somebody's thinking, that's just not right. That's just not right. I don't care if there's deviates who have so suppressed their consciences that they can do that thing. Somebody ought to do something about that. There's no way that's right. Where does that come from? Well, people who, who don't believe in God will tell you it just happens over the eons of time as we condition our brains to believe that little girls shouldn't be raped. I think there's something more than that. Because you go to any civilization that's ever been discovered on the face of the earth, especially those that have isolated tribes, South America, other places where they've never had any outside contact, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find a code of moral right and wrong. Who taught them that? Where does that come from? Paul tells us. He said, even though they haven't heard it, read this with me, verse 15, they demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. That's where it comes from. That's how come you feel bad when you do something wrong. Why? Because it's a remnant of God creating you. It's what uh, Tim Keller calls the fingerprint of God. Each of us has the fingerprint of God on us, and our conscience is where that enters in. Now, you can't dissect it. You can't, you know, you can't look at it, but it's still there. So, Paul says, does God exist? Absolutely. I can give you two, two ways that you should know that. And some of you say, well, I, I don't believe it. Well, Paul writes and says, listen, I'm sorry. You're without excuse. That's still the way it is. The intricacies of creation, the presence of human conscience, tell us that God's there. You may not like it. You may want to reject him. You may want to ignore him. That's your privilege. But just be aware that he's still there. I love what uh, the great mathematician Pascal once said. There is enough light, meaning in the, in the nat natural world, for those who want to believe and enough shadows to blind those who don't. It's up to you what you decide. Now, are there other evidences that God exists? Yes. Yes, there are. As a matter of fact, I was reading a book the other day where somebody was listing 25 different things specific, measurable, understandable, quantitative things that help us to believe, like the ones, the two Paul just gave us, that help us to believe that God exists. I don't have time to share all those. Let me just share some of my favorites with you. Can I do that? Okay, because I'm not going to let you go until I do it anyway, so I don't know why I ask you. You have to say. Okay, here we go. What are some of the other evidences of Christianity that I think are really important? Number one, have you ever heard of the fine-tuning argument for God's existence? It's a fairly new thing that some people are talking about. All the things that have to occur for the universe to exist fall into an extremely narrow range that can be measured, a range of variance. 
Also called the anthropomorphic principle, the universe appears as though it was prepared for human beings. I mean, imagine you have this gigantic wall that's as high as you can see and as wide as you can see, and, and it goes on seemingly forever. And on it are dials and levers and, and, and gauges, and all of them are set at exactly where they need to be by somebody so that the universe appears. If one gauge is off, it doesn't appear. That's essentially what they're saying. Francis Collins is a, a brilliant scientist. Uh, he is the head of the USA uh, National uh, uh, Institutes of Health. Uh, he uh, was in charge of the Human G uh, Genome Project for a while. Uh, he actually raised in a very nominal Episcopalian home, went into the university as an uh, atheist when he was a young man. But through studying the very things we're talking about, he eventually became not only a person of faith, but he became an evangelical Christian. If you look at his, uh, his website, he lists his religion as evangelical Christian. Listen to what he writes about this. And by the way, this guy has had some atheistic books targeting him, just him. He's such a, a thorn in the side of a lot of the militant folks. He's written, when you look from the perspective as a scientist at the universe, it looks as if it knew we were coming. There are 15 constants, things that have to be exactly set. 15 constants, speed of light, gravitational uh, constant, various constants about the strong and weak nuclear force. You all know about this, don't you? I, I read about this stuff a lot. <clears throat> excuse me, nuclear force, etc. I don't know anything about it, that have precise values. If any one of these constants was off by even one part in a million million, the universe could not have actually come to the point where we see it. Matter would not have been able to coalesce. There would be no galaxies, stars, planets, or people. The probability of this perfect calibration happening by chance is so tiny as to be statistically negligible. Now, the non-believers will tell you that when the creation began, when the, when the world began with, with the Big Bang, it, there were maybe 100 million universes created, not just one. And in all of those different universes, one of those is just going to happen to be lucky enough that all the dials are going to spin to the right place. That's what they believe. And if you're, if, you're a, if, if you're a believer in naturalism and humanism, you, don't, you reject theism, reject that God exists, that's what you believe. It, it sounds crazy to me for you to believe that, but if you want to, it's, it's your choice. I believe the fact that there is a God who is the f originator and creator and designer of these kinds of things makes a lot more sense. Another thing, how about talking about the creation? And again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because it's a big subject, a lot of debate, a lot of things could be said. Let's just take this one example. There's something, for, the, the something from nothing question is a huge question that a lot of people struggle with. And many of them believe that theists have the best argument in this. Now again, we're only talking about measurable things here. We're not talking about we've left the spiritual realm, we've come into the, into the classroom. Are you with me? And so many people believe that, that theists have the best uh, answers in this uh, nothing, something from nothing. As a matter of fact, there's a wonderful book written by a guy named Tim Keller. He's a pastor in New York. If you have any interest in this subject, this is the book you should pick up. It's absolutely amazing. He has a great website. He's all over YouTube. You should go check that out too. But pick up the book first. And he, it's called The Reasons, A Reason for God, Belief in an Age of Skepticism. I think we have some copies out at the book table. In this book, he has said, everything we know in this world is contingent. What does contingent mean? It means something else has to happen first. When I look at you, I know that you're contingent on what? You had a mommy and daddy, right? I mean, anybody, did, anybody here just show up at the metro station one day and just say, whoa, here I am, okay. Only in the movies, my friend. Everyone, the world is contingent, has a cause outside itself, in other words. Therefore, the universe, which is just a huge pile of such contingent entities, would have to be dependent on some cause outside itself. It's only logical. There is now evidence the universe is expanding from a single point. Very recent research. Almost all scientists now accept what's called the Big Bang Theory as an explanation for how the universe and time began. I'm not saying I believe in it or don't believe it. I'm just saying that's common thought right now. That's my position. Yet, if the universe is consistent, which it has proven to be, 
Something had to make the Big Bang happen. What could that be but something outside of nature, a supernatural, non-contingent being that exists from itself? You either have to believe that matter and stuff has always existed and has always been changing and it's been blowing up and contracting and blowing up and contracting like a balloon forever. And we just happen to be on one of those expansions when everything fell into the dials all fell into the right place. And so all of us are just products of chance. And your life really means nothing. You're going to live and die and turn into dust and then you, everything's going to contract again and it'll just start all over again. And maybe there'll be another of you in, you know, 300 billion years. And there'll be another person who'll think that they're something, but they're really nothing because it's all just going to contract again. Now, is that more logical? Or is it more logical, as Keller says, that there is a designer somewhere, a being, a benevolent, caring being, who has communicated with us in lots of other ways besides just initiating the Big Bang. Just talking, just talking, okay? Third thing, how about this? The number of highly educated people who believe in God. That's an argument for the existence of God, isn't it? Because so let's be honest. If, if you, as some atheist will tell you, become smart enough, like them, study long enough, like them, and become really sophisticated, like them, guess what? You realize the whole religion God thing is just a big, big, big scam. Doesn't exist, right? So anybody who is a highly educated elite scientist shouldn't believe in God, right? Wrong. And that's what really bothers this guy, <laughs> who is uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. If you ever heard of him, you probably have if you pay attention to the internet or or, PBS, or the public, uh, the Discovery Channel. I love the Discovery Channel. Uh, Dr. Tyson is the director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York City. He also is kind of the successor to Carl Sagan, the famous astronomer, atheist, who's now deceased. Anyway, Tyson uh, is a leading atheist. And recently, just last year, he was speaking at a, uh, a conference that they have, uh, I think, twice a year. It's called I Am Skeptic. And, and it's a great time for everybody who doesn't believe in God to get together. Anyway, he was speaking about the fact that there's people who are educated who still believe in God, and it really bothers him. I got a YouTube clip of it. Would you watch this with me? I want to make an important point. This is not all people in the world. This is Americans, religious people. The, you, the, it depends on which study you get. You ask, do you pray to a personal God? These numbers vary, but they're high, and they're up around 90%. Okay? It might be 85. That's actually not important. That difference is not important for the point I'm about to make. It's high, okay, in the West, in America, 90%. Okay, what percent of religious, what percentage of educated people are religious? The number drops. I'm talking about graduate degrees here. Among all people with masters and PhDs, the religiosity drops, somewhere around 60%, might be 65. The point is it drops with education level. Now let's bring in scientists. How about what percentage of scientists in America are religious? You average over all the branches, it's about 40%, maybe 35%. Uh, in there, there's a range, of course. Biologists, physicists, astrophysicists are lower. The um, sort of engineers and mathematicians are higher. So you, it averages out to about 40%. So this looks like this looks like scientists are 40% down from 90% from the general public. But that's the wrong, no, it's 40% down from 60% because all scientists have graduate degrees. So the graduate degree in any subject gets you halfway there. The science is the increment from the educated degrees. I mean, from the um, all educated people. That takes it down to 40%. Now you go to the elite scientists. This is a well-known number. 7% are religious, claiming a personal God to whom they pray and intervene in their lives. I submit to you that with the current atheist fervor that has taken on over the past several years, 
I would say launched, the modern atheistic hold, launched by the Dawkins book and the Hitchens book and the, and the Sam Harris book and the like. And I was just in Borders recently. Couldn't believe it. I was, I didn't, I, sorry I didn't have a camera. Borders books, there it was. A section called Atheism. It was like, I'd never seen that before. It's like, okay. Yay for atheism. There it was. They had enough critical mass of books to make a section. So, here's my problem. Here's my concern. When you're educated, and you understand how physics works, and you're mathematically literate, and you understand data, and you understand experiment, and you go up to someone who doesn't have that training, and they are religious, and you ask them, why are you religious and believing in invisible things that influence your life? What's wrong with you? Okay? That's unfair. It's not only unfair, it's disrespectful. For the following reason. Until that number is zero, you've got nothing to say to the general public. These are scientists among us in the National Academy of Sciences who are religious and pray to a personal God, and I know some of them. And you're fighting the public for the religious beliefs? Figure that one out first, because maybe there's an asymptote. Maybe you can't change everybody. Maybe that's telling us something. Maybe there's something in the brain wiring that positively prevents some people from ever being an atheist. And if that's the case, in a way, they can't help it. And you'll never know it because you're not one of them. So I ask you, first, for compassion with the public, but you should target your exercise and your experiments on understanding that number. Because that's not zero. Yes, it's low, but it's not 1%, it's not one half of a percent or a tenth of a percent. It is 7%, one out of 14. If this were the National Academy of Sciences with 900, you'd have 100 people in here. Did I do that right? 7%? <laughs> <laughs> Carry the two, what, 65? Sorry, seven times nine, yeah, so six, uh, yeah. You have 65 people in here among elite scientists praying to their personal God. You know, I really like, uh, I really like Tyson. I think he is a really smart guy, and I've, I've watched the Cosmos series. Uh, it's very interesting. I love astronomy. You probably know that. Uh, I'm passionate about it. However... And, and I think he's very charismatic and very entertaining and interesting. He has a lot of really good things to say. However, I think here he has peeled back the covers and let us see the real guy. It, it, to me, it's like he was starting out trying to make a point against religion and belief. And I think it backfired on him. And instead, he ended up making a point that there are lots of highly educated elite scientists who still believe in God. How is that possible? And you know what his answer was? And it offends me. That he says, well, I think if you believe in God, that there's just got to be something wrong in your brain. I mean, the last time I checked, isn't that historically been what we've always said about people we wanted to somehow put down and disagree with and say, uh, you know, you're a bad person, you're not as smart, you're not, you know, you don't look right, you, you know, clearly uh, you're, you're, you're not as good as we, I think that's what Adolf Hitler was saying, wasn't it? Didn't he say a lot of stuff like that? That really troubles me that that would be the, the case that he would wind up saying that. And I really, I think it's astounding. I looked up how many um, people are in the National Academy of Sciences online. There's about 2,500 people. So if their statistics are right, that means, I used a calculator, that means there's about 175 elite scientists in America alone who believe that God exists. And they're a whole lot smarter than me. <laughs> and they believe it. Yeah, amen. I think that's a good thing. Anyway, those are three really brainiac arguments. Let me show you one more and we'll be done. Do you struggle to believe the Bible at times? Do you, all the attacks on the Bible, everybody running the Bible down, writing books about how it's not true and it you know, wasn't written by who it said it was and blah, 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 blah. Guess what? I came across a great argument the other day. It's the argument that the reliability of John's gospel has been confirmed by recent archaeological studies in Jerusalem. And you'll never guess what it uh, came about through. It came about through finding this pool, the pool of Siloam. Talked about in the New Testament. Listen to this. 
This is from uh, last year, 2013. The distinctive nature of the book of John has led many modern scholars to conclude that John was the last gospel compiled dating to the second century and clearly, therefore, not written by John, nor, nor is it historical. However, recent archaeological work has brought that finding into question. Charles, James H. Charlesworth. I don't know why smart people always have names like that. You know, like, I'm Jim. I mean, you can tell. You know, it's a public school guy who, you know, struggles to pronounce words. You know, James H. Charlesworth, professor of New Testament language and literature, editor of the Dead Sea Scrolls Project at Princeton. Ooh, important is he, yeah. Outline some of the new archaeological findings in the environs of Jerusalem that are challenging the detractors of the uh, book of John. Charlesworth uh, contended that recent finds demonstrate convincingly, and this is a guy from Princeton, he's probably, you know, who knows, who knows what he believes, that the gospel of John was probably written much earlier than often suggested and is therefore valuable for the study of the historical Jesus. And proof of that came through the uh, archaeological work done in finding the pool of Siloam. There, I don't know if you, know if you remember or not, but in John 9, uh, John talks about this big massive pool that's by the temple, and there's a guy who's blind, and Jesus goes and he heals him, and he declares, I'm the light of the world. And the critics of the Bible have said, oh, that was just somebody 150 years after Jesus trying to make Jesus look good, and so they invented the whole story. And since they'd never been to Jerusalem, clearly they, need, they made up this thing about a pool there. And they, you know, John describes it and what it's like. Listen to what this is. Um, In 2004, archaeologists discovered an ancient pool in the southern portion of the city of David. So if you get your bearings here, just quickly, I only have a laser pointer up here. But right here, you'll see the temple mount would be here, okay? The wailing wall would be here, and the, uh, the, the golden dome would be right here. This is the uh, Mount of Olives. Everybody got it? These would be what's called the southern steps, which are steps that had been excavated oh, a long time ago, which led into the temple. And there was a thought that there were some small underground baths here. Guess what they have uncovered? As you can see in this picture, they found this massive pool, which is at least 50 meters long, and it looks like it's a series of pools, which would have been exactly what John uh, describes. So uh, they discovered an ancient pool in the southern part of the city, uh, which was, has been hidden since 70 A.D. Recent discoveries uh, of the Pool of Siloam demonstrate that the author of the Gospel of John knew intimate details about pre-70 A.D. Jerusalem that even Josephus the historian fails to mention. He knew things about Jerusalem we didn't know until just 10 years ago. The accuracy of the Johnian information has clearly established, writes Urban C. von Waldi. What a name. I would love to have a name like that, you know? <laughs> you know, James... Bartholomew, you know, Waddell Hauser, you know, preaches at fellowship. The professor of uh, theology, uh, he's written in his book, Jesus and Archaeology, John can no longer be read as strictly a theological work comprised of invented stories to illustrate its theological truths. End of article. So the next time somebody says, oh, you can't trust the Bible, you say, well, that's funny because uh, there's a lot of leading archaeologists who would disagree with you. So what's the conclusion? You can read it as well as I can. Believe in God. It's not a leap in the dark. Instead, call out to him, even with your doubts, and he will reveal himself to you. Now, as I close, I want to invite Pastor Stephen to come up. Pastor Stephen Sanson. Stephen is uh, on our staff. Uh, you probably know Stephen. He is, uh, okay, let's jump over here and we'll uh, sit down because I've been standing up. I'm tired. Um, Stephen is uh, studying uh, at uh, Veritas Seminary right now and is in the process of getting his uh, master's. And uh, he has a particular interest in what we're talking about today, which is the subject of the history and reliability of uh, Christianity. And uh, that's why I asked him to step up. Also, he was a big help to me in preparing this message. So he's a really smart guy. Okay, even though his name's just Stephen, he's still a pretty smart guy. <laughs> so uh, Stephen, suppose there's somebody here 
they really have uh, been, uh, gotten interested. Uh, maybe their, answers, their questions are all answered. They'd like to find out more information. How can they do that? Yeah, well, we have a, a few things. Um, unfortunately, it didn't make it into your bulletin this morning, but uh, we have some out in Connection Central. We have a, a book list that some of the books that uh, Jim mentioned in his sermon and then uh, some online resources. And uh, we'll be having a, uh, a equip class on November 21st at 9 a.m. And we're going to look at... Um, the Dawkins and John Lewis Lennox. Len, sorry, Lennox debate, and uh, we're going to have a discussion following that uh, at 9 o'clock on the 21st. So if you're interested uh, in this stuff, it's, I think it's a great place to start. Some of these books or online resources are a great place to, to begin to study some of these topics. So that'll be the very f- next week after this series on Doubt Ends. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Great. Mm-hmm. Uh, suppose, I know you've given a, a lot of reading and studying in this area. Suppose there's somebody here today who's still not convinced and uh, they're still struggling to believe that God even exists or that Christianity is true. Suppose you had an opportunity to say one thing to them. What would you say? Um, you know, I, I know all the arguments for God, all the, the arguments that atheists make and all the different um, perceptions and, and uh, things that... But for me, aside from the argument for God, it's a very subjective um, response. And I would say that I have, uh, have immense amount of peace and purpose in my life because of what Jesus has done in my life. And uh, prior to me becoming Christian, I felt like I was uh, like a, a feather going along the wind, blown in, in the wind. And, and really it wasn't until um, I embraced uh, God and, and Jesus, uh, where I found true purpose in my life. And I believe since then, these things that you've mentioned today confirm it. It's not just a feeling or, a, or a, um, an emotion. It's backed in, on rational belief, I, I believe. So I don't know, that's what I would share. It's more from a subjective heart issue that, that I've felt this peace. So. Mm. Yep. And I'm sure you'd be glad to talk to anyone if they'd like to come up and chat yeah, with you absolutely. afterwards. Maybe you can yep. hang down here at the front yep. and do that. Yep. Great. Oh. There is a, uh, a prayer that you also might like to pray. Uh, I, I call it a doubter's prayer. And uh, again, you may not want to pray it. Maybe you just want to read it. Uh, you, that may be where you are in your spiritual journey. That's fine. Some of you may want to actually pray this along with me because you're, uh, you're seeking and you're ready to ask God to give you some, some genuine answers. But the prayer goes like this. Uh, Dear God... And again, bow your heads if you'd like. Dear God, this feels weird speaking to someone I can't see. I never believed you were real, except when I was a kid. But now, I don't know. I'm confused. So God, if you are there, I want to know it. I want to believe in you. I've learned things about you, maybe even this morning, that I didn't know. And some things are beginning to make sense to me. One thing I do know is that I need help. And I don't know where to turn to get it. So God, show me that you're real and show me what I need to do. I still have a lot of questions and doubts, but I'm asking you to give me the faith to believe in you. In Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that you love us. You love us so much. You sent your your son. You actually came down, God, a human being, a human form yourself, God and man, in order to give yourself on the cross for us. Jesus died for us that our sins would be forgiven. And I pray right now that you'd help anyone who's struggling to understand how you can exist, how the world came into being. Lord, I pray that all of these many things would not keep them from, as Stephen was talking about, dealing with the deeper issues of the heart and of their life. Because, Lord, I know if they'll do that, they will find the same thing I've found a God who's there. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.